Good. Okay, cool. Um, I can start off. So I work at Gender Spectrum. My name is Jenna Hackman. Um, I manage all of our online programming, so exciting events and things like this. Uh, my pronouns are they, them. Yeah. And I'm excited to hang out with you today and to talk a little bit about a topic we know a lot of people are thinking about. Yeah. Yeah, totally. This is something that, like, whenever I go talk at schools or, like, colleges or churches or whatever, um, the youth are always the ones with the coolest questions. So I love this youth stuff. Definitely. Yeah, totally. Yeah, so you um, want to introduce so, yeah, yourself and what yeah. you do at Gender Spectrum and also what you do out in the world when you're not at Gender Spectrum. You're a very busy person. <laughs> yeah, it's been a lot of travel lately. Um, so my name is Austin Hartke. I am Gender Spectrum's faith coordinator. So I sort of get all of the programs for parents and youth and uh, care providers and all these things uh, happening on the faith side. Um, that's all stuff that I organize. And so uh, part of what I do is talk with people of lots of different faiths about their gender and their experience of gender and their kids' experience of gender. And um, so, yeah, really what I do is focus on sort of the faith side of things. I'm coming from, like, my background is, is a Christian background, but at Gender Spectrum, all the faith stuff we do is as interfaith and multi-faith as we can possibly make it. So uh, that's kind of my background and probably what I'll talk a little bit about, but definitely not the only thing we do. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And well, you just pronouns are he him his. Cool. And you have a book too. Do you want to share anything yeah, about your true. book before we start? I suppose I better. Uh, that's always <laughs> the thing that I think of last. Uh, yeah, no, I wrote a book uh, recently and it came out in April and it's specifically about um, trans identities and like within Christianity. So it's sort of half theology and sort of like talking about Bible passages and how we understand them and how we translate them. And then the other half is just stories from gender diverse people uh, who also identify as Christian. And so each chapter is kind of like half Bible study story, half modern story. Uh, yeah, it's, it was really fun to write. I feel really glad that I got to do that with so many amazing people um, and really privileged to be able to listen to their stories. So um, I think stories are one of the things that we're finding uh, can change the world in a lot of ways and change people's hearts in a lot of ways that sometimes throwing facts at them doesn't. Mm -hmm. um, so I think our, like any time that we can share our experiences and our stories is going to be a good one. Yeah, that's so true. It resonates more with people when they hear actual examples of things, put a face to the things that they're learning about or hearing about. Yeah, exactly. And I think a lot of times people, if they have a specific belief about a certain kind of people, um, it's easier to have that belief when you don't actually know somebody who identifies in whatever way that is. And so once mm -hmm. you meet somebody who actually identifies that way and you have to like realize that the people that you're having these opinions about are like human beings, that really changes things for a lot of people. Yeah, totally. Cool. So I see some people joining. I was thinking, why don't we kick it off with, I have a couple questions. And for those of you joining, if you have questions, feel free to um, comment them and we'll try to get to them. So I have, I'm going to let you choose between these if you have one you want to answer more. Um, so one is if you could share a little bit about kind of why you do this work and why you're interested in sort of these topics and intersections of gender and faith. So that's, that's one choice. All the right. second is, um, could you share maybe one or two kind of common themes of questions that you get from young people, hmm. like things that you know young people are kind of thinking about or navigating. Yeah, I think um, I could answer the first one first because it's probably shorter, uh, or I can make <laughs> it shorter. Um, yeah, I mean, the reason I do this stuff is because I uh, came out as trans, well, I came out as bisexual when I was about 15, and that was my first experience, like, learning about LGBT people and, uh, and being in a church at the time that wasn't non-affirming, but it wasn't affirming either. They just kind of hadn't really talked about how they wanted to deal with it. And so that was where um, the second experience I had was coming out as transgender while I was in seminary. Um, and I went to seminary to study biblical uh, well, my degrees in biblical studies, um, specifically in theology. And so um, coming out as trans during that process, really, like when people ask me about like, how my gender and my faith intersect, like they're so interwoven, because I came out as trans mm -hmm. at the same time that I was doing all of this big study. 
that like I can't separate them. They're they're very intertwined for me. So for me, that it's a very personal thing. Um, and so, the reason that I that I do this work is because I think um, I think one, it's important that people of faith get support because a lot of times people are kind of pushed into choosing either their identity or their faith. Like you yeah. kind of get one or the other. Um, and that's kind of a false choice. Like you can have both things. And so raising awareness that like you can have both things and, and giving support to our community. Um, but then also to show people in faith communities who maybe aren't LGBTQ plus affirming that they're kind of missing out. Like if they don't uh, integrate LGBTQ plus people and gender diverse people into that community, they're actually missing out on some really cool gifts that we bring that kind of nobody else has. So I think it's kind of a two pronged thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it just that concept of having to choose one or the other. I feel like that's something that as um, gender diverse people were constantly being challenged by of like, you can't hold this identity and other aspects of your identity. So it just breaks my heart when I hear that, because I know that for so many of us and for so many young people, that is something that um, can come up a lot in your day to day life. It's true. And like, even even within LGBTQ plus communities, we have that happen where like bisexual people will be like, well, choose one. Are you gay or straight? Or mm -hmm. non-binary people will be like, choose one. <laughs> you know, you either have to be male or female. So I think that sort of choice between two things, that sort of false choice comes up a lot for people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Remind me what the second question <laughs> <laughs> The second question was, um, I wanted to hear a little bit about what are some common themes or questions that you get a lot from young people, whether it's things they're navigating or things where you're like, oh, this is something that will definitely or most likely come up in a conversation, um, sort of talking about intersections of faith and gender? Mm. Um, I, think, I think the most common worry that I hear from young folks, especially if they have been raised in um, more... I mean, I guess I would use the word conservative, but that's not quite what I mean. Like more fundamentalist backgrounds, mm -hmm. I think is the better word. Um, a lot of people are afraid, uh, especially in faith traditions like Christianity um, that have this concept of hell, right? A lot of kids that I talk to are really afraid of like, if I do the wrong thing, I'm going to hell. And that's like a really, really common fear. Um, and that's, so that's probably the thing that I deal with the most is like, how do we understand um, what our identities mean for us and how do we deal with that fear? Because you don't want to dismiss it. Like if you are raised in a tradition that teaches that, you know, you, if you do bad things, then you go to hell after you die. Like that's a big thing to try to unpack. And so um, for me and, and my work, I think it's, it's, a lot of, it's a lot more about like unpacking why we believe those things or how we understand those things or like, what texts lie behind those things, understanding those texts better. Um, so yeah, so it's a lot of um, dealing with that fear, I think is kind of one of the main mm -hmm. things. Um, other questions that I get a lot. Um, questions about like, are there people like me in the Bible? Um, that, which is like one of the fun things that I get to talk about because <laughs> there are gender diverse people in the Bible. You don't hear about them that often. Um, and especially because if you aren't a gender diverse or, or queer person reading the Bible, you might not see those differences. So like if you are somebody who has no concept of gender diversity, you're reading through it and you just sort of read it with your own lenses and you don't think like, oh, that person is sort of like dressing different or acting in a different way, you know? Um, but when you read it with sort of a, with a lens of knowing that those people do exist, you tend to start seeing them in, in those places. Um, so yeah, talking about like, yes, there have, there have been gender diverse people throughout human history and we can find them in the Bible. Yeah. yeah. I think one of the things that I, um, have really been enjoying when I talk with parents with some of the work that I do with parents is, um, we like parents, you know, are kind of sometimes if their kid comes out as trans or as non-binary or gender fluid, they kind of don't quite know what to do at first. Um, but, and like, there are some hard times a lot of times in the beginning, but one of the things that I've loved doing leading some of the parents groups is I will get parents who are like, you know, it has been difficult, but like my kid coming out has actually taught me so much about my faith. It has like helped show me some of these great things about my faith that I never thought about before, never knew about before. And so 
um, I think that's something that teens don't get to hear that often. Is like totally. you're actually helping your parents' faith in a lot of ways. Like challenge is not always bad. It gets us thinking about new things, and sometimes parents need that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think we talk about that a lot of um, kind of changing the narrative a little bit too around navigating your gender. And oftentimes in the media, all we see are these really like terrible and difficult things. And I think especially for parents. Um, having that conversation of like, yes, this is going to be really hard and could be really difficult, but also there's going to be like so many blessings along the way in this journey and you're going to grow in all of these ways that you would never have thought of. So I think that's a really cool point to kind of bring it back to how that could be, um, you know, totally connected to like a faith experience and navigating that too. Yeah. I was talking with a mom uh, a couple of weeks ago who was saying that until their kid came out as gender fluid, they had never thought about how they thought about God's gender or mm. like lack of gender or whatever, um, because they come from a tradition that sees God as like exclusively male. Mm-hmm. Um, and their kid coming out kind of got them thinking about like, hmm, why, why do we do that? And what, how, what does that mean about what we believe about God? So it was really interesting. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, we got some questions. Yeah, I'm seeing. Let's see. Do you feel like you're going against your religion? I'm struggling to balance sexuality and faith, especially since I was raised in a conservative family. Um, I think uh, one of the things that helped me understand my sexuality and my faith was um, coming to understand that there are differences between, um, like, practices and ideas about practices change over time. So there are ideas within Christianity about differing sexualities and genders that were different way back when, like, the New Testament was written than they were uh, during the Middle Ages, which are different than they are now, you know? So these practices and ideas change over time. And so one of the things that really helped me in understanding my sexuality and my faith was um, learning more about how those things have been seen over time and how, like, what the context of a lot of the Bible verses around sexuality was Um, that really helped me a lot, realizing that um, they're, like, long, long, long story short, um, the Bible verses that we see that that tend to be used against people of different sexualities uh, tend to have been either mistranslated or uh, misunderstood in terms of ancient sexuality versus modern sexuality. Um, And if you're interested in that, there's this really great book called Bible Gender Sexuality, pretty easy to remember. It's by a guy named James Brownson. And it really, um, he's, there are lots of books about this, but his was the one that I found most helpful, kind of digging into those issues. Can you talk about inclusive practices among faith leaders? Yeah, there are so many. And this is actually a great time to shout out a video project that we're doing at Gender Spectrum right now. Um, I'm doing interviews with uh, gender diverse faith leaders and allies uh, of gender diverse faith leaders. We're kind of broadening it a little bit so that we can get more and more voices involved. But so we've got over on our YouTube channel, on Gender Spectrum's YouTube channel, we've got a sort of playlist called, uh, gosh, what is it called? I think it's called Interviews with Gender Expansive Faith Leaders. Um, But uh, so we've got faith leaders from Jewish and Christian and Muslim backgrounds, and I'm just getting ready to do an interview with um, a uh, gender diverse person who is very active in a Buddhist community. And then hopefully later this month, we are going to have uh, an interview or that's sort of like a conversation between um, two people who are um, Native American and Two-Spirit about how gender and faith is different in their two different tribes because they come from different parts of the country. So um, there are lots of like, I'm just excited about being able to like showcase these faith leaders because they are showing us what gender inclusive uh, and generally inclusive yeah. practices look like. Um, you know, one of the things that I find really, really wonderful, that's just sort of a uh, I want to say baseline thing, but it's not quite baseline, uh, is, is the use of language in uh, faith communities. So a lot of times, like for instance, in um, Christian communities, we say things like, you know, brothers and sisters in Christ, mm-hmm. um, as a sort of like form of address, kind of like ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> um, that, that tends to erase non-binary people. And so um, that's one of those things where if you go into a church community that says something like brothers and sisters and siblings in Christ or just siblings in Christ, that is an immediate sort of um, uh, nod to the folks in the congregation who might not identify as just male or just female. 
Um, and that's like, it's one of those things that seems so small, uh, but means a lot to the people sitting in the pews for whom like that is something that they're thinking about a lot of the time. Mm -hmm. um, it happens a lot with songs as well, especially in Christian communities, if you sing hymns or, well, not even hymns, like praise songs, where sometimes they'll be like, you know, men sing this verse, women sing this uh -huh. verse. Um, and so that, like, I remember going through that when my voice was changing, when I started testosterone and like feeling like, okay, well, I can't sing the women's line, but I kind of can't sing the men's line either. <laughs> and like, my voice is right in the middle and it keeps cracking. Um, so changing it to something like high voices and low voices is a lot mm -hmm. better way of like designating that. So language, I think is one of the big things that faith communities can do. Think about the language that you use for the people in the in the community, and then also think about the language that you use for God, because um, there, if you are in a faith tradition that has a God or a higher power, the language that we use to talk about that higher power, um, if it tends to be only masculine all the time, we get a certain sense of like God as this old white man in the cloud, which like mm -hmm. doesn't really work with most of our theology, I think. <laughs> So yeah, just thinking about language I think, is one of the big things too. Yeah. What about um for like is there do you have any advice for youth who maybe are already have a faith community that is really important to them, but maybe they're noticing that it's not super gender affirming and I I could imagine that there could be sort of this like feeling pulled between like I have this community, it's so important to me. Um, I need to be in this space, but I'm also like recognizing that there are areas where it's not affirming these parts of me that are also really important. Um, do you have any advice around that or things that youth could do to navigate that or ways that they could work with their faith communities? Um, yeah, I'd love to hear just kind of your thoughts on, you know, youth who are in that situation. Yeah, it's one of those things where like we always want to emphasize that youth um, stay safe and like not come out if they're in a place where they feel like um, that might be dangerous to them or it might, you know, cause them to um, lose housing or something like that. So you always have to be careful. And I would never counsel anybody to like go talk to somebody they're not sure about. But having said that, I think one of the best things that you can do is find other people in your community who um, may be having some of the same thoughts as you. And that might be people your age. It might be a youth counselor or a youth leader. It might be the pastor or it might be the rabbi or the imam. Like, somebody who you think um, might be open to having a conversation, not even like you coming out to them, but like, it could just be like, um, hey, this is something I've seen in the news, or hey, this is something I read a book about at school or whatever, like bringing it up in sort of a way that's not as connected to you might feel a little bit less scary. Um, because if you can find even one or two people in the community that you can kind of get together with, um, it'll allow you to start creating some um, some stronger relationships that will help support you if you do decide to come out. Um, so that's that's you know something that we call grassroots activism or grassroots organizing. When you find like a couple people that are sort of around your same area, and then you work together, and then say um, like I had uh, this conversation with somebody a couple of weeks ago where they said my pastor preached this sermon that was really um, it was really intense about like the roles of men and women. And it's not like our church was, is like super uh, bad with things like gender roles. It's, I think he just wasn't really thinking about it. And mm -hmm. so this person got together with a couple other people that had heard the same sermon and they knew were kind of like having a weird time with it. And they, they all went to the pastor as like four people just to be like, hey, we just want you to know that this kind of bugged us for these reasons. And like, we're not saying that you did anything wrong, but we just wanted to bring that to your attention so that, you know, if you're thinking about gender, mm -hmm. this is a way that we think about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's such a great tactic in life, too, of just like, the power of even just finding a couple people who align with you or who can support you and starting there versus feeling like you're navigating things completely on your own. Totally. Um, yeah, yeah, and like, even, I think, um, I think if you are in a place where you know that there's maybe nobody in your community that might be open to having those conversations, I think that's when you can find a lot of great community online. Um, and like online is not the same as in person in a lot of ways, but it's better than nothing. Right. Mm -hmm. And I think, um, one of the, one of the ways that people have been getting connected, if you are in, um, uh, faith spaces, there's a group called trans faith, um, that does a lot of things with different faith traditions and they're great. And they can, if you go to their website, I think it's transfaith.org. Um, 
they might be .com. I'm not sure about that. <laughs> but uh, they, they're wonderful. And if you email them, their email's like right on the front page. And if you email them and say like, hey, I'm looking for to connect with somebody in my faith tradition, they'll email you back and like get you connected with somebody. Mm -hmm. um, there are some other groups, specifically in Christian circles. Um, I love recommending the Reformation Project. Um, because they are uh, really great at integrating all parts of people's identity, whether it's their gender, their sexuality, their race, their ethnicity, their you know immigration status. Like they're really good at at integrating people's identities and providing support. So you can go to the Reformation Project, and they will have more for you there too. Mm -hmm. Cool, that's super helpful. Is there anything else that you want to kind of talk about, maybe that we haven't already talked about? Um. Let's see. So I've mentioned our cool video project. So you should definitely go check that out. Um, oh, uh, we've got, so next week is like this big teen storytelling event. And I definitely want to talk about that a little bit. What we're planning to do is um, if you are 18 between ages 12 and what is it, 19, um, you can come and we're going to do a bit of a storytelling event. We just did one with parents, which was really fun. But the idea is um, you call into our Zoom call, and you can do that like on your phone, on your computer, whatever you want to do. You can do just be in chat. Um, and uh, we just want to open up a space for people to share their experiences. So it might, you know, sometimes they're negative experiences, and it's important to like share those to sort of let some other people carry a little bit of that with you. Um, sometimes they're really positive experiences, like if you've had a really great experience in your faith community that you want to share. Um, I'll probably talk about uh, my renaming ceremony that I had at mm -hmm. my church, and that was like a super affirming experience for me, so I'll probably talk about that. Um, but, but the idea is just to share um, our stories because, uh, again, it's sort of like when we share our stories, we feel less alone, um, mm -hmm. and so that's kind of the point. Yeah, and I think that totally loops back to what you were talking about at the beginning of like the power of storytelling, and mm -hmm. I feel like there's already such limited narratives around trans and non-binary people in general. Yeah. And I feel like when you add all these other experiences in there, we even get less and less of those stories. And so I think that's the other reason too we wanna to do it is to be able to really highlight what is it like to be navigating your gender and your faith? What are the goods and the bads and the challenges and how can we kind of support each other in that process? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think there's, um, there's this real sense out there that like, oh, I must be the only one like me, but like, you're totally not. There are other mm -hmm. people out here dealing with the same stuff. And um, I'll, in our in our group next week, it's, so it's next Wednesday, but uh, in our group next week, um, I'm going to be, or is it Tuesday? Oh my gosh, Jenna, can you tell me which one it is so I don't give people the wrong information. I think it's Wednesday. Okay, and the cool. link is the link is in our bio. So you can click on that link and there's a sign up form on there yes. um, to get more information. Yeah, I've got the link in my bio as well over on my uh, Instagram page. So Either way, you should sign up. It's going to be nice. <laughs> um, but uh, I'm going to be showing some resources uh, in that group as well of books that we've got that tell the stories of LGBTQ people of faith. Um, because, again, it's like having those stories at hand and knowing that you're not the only one out there is really powerful in times when it feels like, oh, I'm the only one dealing with this. Totally. Yeah, Definitely. Um, I have one qu one more question. It's like kind of deep, so I don't know how right. far we want to take it. But um, since no one is posting anything, one of the questions I have is just, and I think about this a lot for myself too, is what advice, do you have any advice for like your younger self? Um, you know, or like advice you have for a youth maybe where you're a little bit further along in the process uh -huh. that you wish you had known or someone had told you when you were you know, just a little bit younger? Yeah, that's a good question. I, somebody asked me this the other day, and I jokingly said, like, I would tell my younger self that I'm trans. That would have been the, <laughs> the first um, one. <laughs> would have made sense of a whole lot of things. Um, I think the, the thing that I wish that my younger self knew was that I could, hmm, this is a hard <laughs> thing to try to explain. I wish that my younger self could feel open to trust people in my community a little bit more mm -hmm. um, because I had like totally normal um, fears about like, like people responding negatively if I came out to them and like that's totally normal and, and helps like that sense sort of keeps us safe in, in important times. Um, but I also wish that I would have trusted the people that I knew cared about me a little bit more because as it turned out when I did come out later on 
the people that I already knew deeply cared about me were like, yeah, obviously, like, it's totally okay. Mm -hmm. um, and that's not everybody's experience, but for me it was. And so I, I think, um, and especially like there are people who sometimes don't really know how to tell you that they're supportive. So they'll kind of beat around it a little bit and be like, you know, oh, my other friend who's gay said so-and-so, <laughs> like, like sneakily tell you that like, it's okay. Um, and I wish I would have trusted that a little bit more and, and been a little bit more open with them because it would have, again, made me feel less alone to be able to tell people. And so, mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think giving people the positive benefit of the doubt is always mm -hmm. good. Yeah. That example just made me laugh because I was recently in Ireland visiting a lot of family mm -hmm. and some who are like a bit, you know, older and some of them would all of a sudden be like telling a story about someone and I would be like, why are we talking about this? And then I'd realize like, oh, they're queer. Oh, they're gender non-conforming. That's why we're talking about them. Like, yep. <laughs> so I totally, that just, that made me laugh because I can totally, totally relate to that. Yeah, totally. Yeah. <laughs> that happens all the time. Yeah. And I think that's hard. You know, it's hard to, it, advice like what you wanted to know when you're younger is always so much easier in hindsight, you know, mm -hmm. but in the moment, it's so hard and you're thinking right. about moment, so many things. Right. In the moment, you're just like, yeah, in the moment, you're just like, this person cares about me so much. And what if they decide they don't anymore? And that's like incredibly scary. So totally. it's yeah. not something that I like blame my younger self or anybody for, but in hindsight, I'm like, oh, I should have, I should have told them something and like allowed that relationship to, to get stronger. through. Mm -hmm. that. Yeah. yeah. Ooh, we got a new question. Oh, uh, do you have any religious relatives that don't accept you? If so, how did you deal with it? Oh, I am still dealing with it, friend. Um, yeah, no, I've got some extended family members that are not too keen about me being me. Um, and it's from for them, it stems from, um, I think one of the things that maybe we don't always realize as teenagers or as youth is that um, a lot of the negative stuff that we get when we come out from parents and family members stems from their fear for us. Like they care about us so much that, and they're like afraid for us. And sometimes that's afraid for us. Like they're afraid that we're not going to have a good life. And sometimes it's a fear of like, you might not go to heaven, you know? And like, it's that kind of fear, you know? And, but either way, it's like, they're scared for you because they care. Um, and that doesn't always make it feel any better, but like it sometimes can be a little bit helpful to be like, oh, I know that they're doing this because they care about me. So it's something to keep that I try to keep in my back of my head. But, um, but for me, my family members that aren't okay with me being trans are um, very uh, connected to these sort of religious ideas that they have about what men and women are supposed to do and who men and women are supposed to be. And so for them, it doesn't make sense that I could be trans because they're like, no, men do this, women do this. And like, that's the way the world works. Um, and that's sort of like the divinely ordained way that the world works. And so anything that doesn't fit, fit in that is really hard for them to understand. Um, so yeah, so in terms of how I've dealt with it, um, there are times when I've had to set some boundaries to protect myself about like, um, I'm not going to go to this particular family gathering if like, for instance, um, at one point, uh, they're also not keen on so this is confusing part. They don't like that I identify as male, but they also don't like that I have a girlfriend because they still see me as female and then they see that as gay. So like, it's a whole thing. <laughs> it's like, you can't get it right either way. But there was one Christmas where they said, you know, you're, you're, you are welcome, but your girlfriend is not welcome. And so mm -hmm. at that point, I was like, this is the point where I'm going to draw a boundary and say, like, you know what, I'm not going to come if, if my partner isn't welcome as well. Um, and so there are certain times where I draw boundaries. There are other times when we try to meet in the middle. And sometimes that looks like me um, not making a big deal when they get my name and pronouns wrong uh, for like holiday events. And that's, that's like all of these boundaries and lines and meeting in the middle, that's all personal um, to people. Like so, for some people that would absolutely not be okay. For me, I feel like it's okay right now. Um, someday I'm gonna show up for Christmas with a huge beard and they're gonna be like, well, now what do we do, you know? <laughs> <laughs> um, so it's, it's time, it takes a lot of time. Um, and it's not just, what I'm finding out is that it's not just sitting around time, it's like intense, like we're intentionally having a relationship kind of time, which is hard mm -hmm. um, when somebody doesn't recognize you for who you are. 
Um, and in the end of the day, you kind of have to ask yourself, like, is this something that I am willing to keep putting energy into? And that's not always the case for everybody. For me right now, it is something I'm still working on. Um, but who knows? Who knows what the future will hold? Yeah. Yeah, I was just thinking, too, we're, um, at Gender Spectrum, we're putting together kind of a holiday support plan for both parents and youth that talks a lot about the things that you had mentioned kind of like what are your boundaries what feels comfortable for you what makes you feel safe and affirmed and you know acknowledging that those can look so different for each person but I think that piece of being able to kind of check in with yourself um, and knowing that those can evolve over time yeah. Um, but yeah I think that's such a good point mm -hmm. have you seen with any of your relatives that like their views have evolved or changed or um i i mean i've seen uh a movement toward <laughs> inquisitiveness and curiosity <laughs> which i really appreciate like i would yeah. much rather have them be curious and want to know more um than just be like totally disconnected whoa just, just getting so excited um <laughs> and so like um I know that one of my relatives has read the book that I wrote. Um, mm -hmm. and, and so like that speaks to the fact that they were curious about what it said, even if they, in the end of the day, kind of disagree with what I wrote, at least they were curious enough to look into it. And so I think the movement I've seen is from like a complete refusal to curiosity. And I hope that we can keep living into that curiosity rather than sort of shutting down. Conversation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. At least having some conversation versus none uh yeah. we just got a comment here it says love the holiday support plan my son had 95 percent acceptance in our family but some family members struggle on holidays will be challenging yeah that's common that's common yeah. <laughs> that holidays are challenging yeah I, i'll throw out another resource too there's um there's this wonderful website my friend emmy runs called queer grace um and queer grace has a uh, resource pack that they put out for the last couple of years and i think they're going to do another one this year called blue christmas Mm -hmm. um, and that's specifically for folks in Christian, uh, Christian denominations, but, um, it's got, you know, music and suggested things to read and stuff like that that can be really helpful. So I definitely check that out too. Yeah, that's cool. We were just talking today at the office about just like, there's just so many moving pieces during the holidays mm -hmm. and you're in so many environments that you're not in for like majority of the year. And also so many things are gendered. Um, yeah. <laughs> from just like the traditions you do with your family to like the things in the services that you're at or the faith traditions that you follow to like the, cl it's just like on another level, I feel like. And so you're navigating yeah. all of that while also navigating like being around different family members and thinking about presents and it's just, it's a lot. So I'm glad to hear that yeah, some people think that will be helpful and it'll definitely be kind of an evolving resource as we hear back from people sort of what they're navigating and what's coming up for them. Yeah, definitely. I think one of the things that I often hear around Christmas for people in Christian communities is that Christmas and Easter, to a lesser extent, are the two times when people are, like, required to go to church with their families, and that yeah. often means being required to wear certain clothes that don't affirm their gender. Totally. Um, and so dealing with that can be really tough to be in a situation that you're already nervous about and then have to be in clothes that don't feel like your clothes. Um, and it's it can be really stressful. And so, like, finding ways to uh, affirm yourself, even if it has to be in non-visible ways, like, mm -hmm. you know, wearing uh, a bracelet that, you know, says something about you or what you believe or that reminds you of who you are, like things that can, um, that can affirm you and things you can do to affirm yourself, even if you're in those situations. Or mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, so that will be coming, and we'll all yeah. be, I'm sure, thinking about our gender even more in the next couple of months. <laughs> Yeah. Ooh, new question. Um, you're gonna have to cut us off here, Jenna, when you wanna. I know. Cut us off, so. We'll do maybe we'll do um maybe five more minutes. Okay, sounds and good. And then for those of you who have like burning questions or um, want to talk more, I know some of you just joined, but we have a link in Gender Spectrum's bio and in Austin's bio to a faith. Um, storytelling event that we're going to be doing next week so if you're wanting to like continue connecting and talking about these things this is just like the teaser to be able to get to do that more next week mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah and if you've ever got anything that you feel like you need to talk to somebody privately about you can always email me my email is a at genderspectrum.org you can always email me at gender spectrum to talk to you um my partner is jewish but i am not religious any advice on how i can support him 
I was already invited for a ceremony on Friday, and that will be my first time reconnecting with this faith. Oh, that's so sweet. You got invited. That's great. <laughs> you're like, that's uh, a good sign. Yeah, right. You're invited. So that's awesome. Uh, in terms of how you can support him, mm, well, I suppose it would depend on what kind of ceremony or service it is, um, but it, like if it's sort of a regular weekly one or if it's a special one. But um, I think one of the things that you can do is just be interested um, and like ask questions, maybe not like uh, like questions that you might be, that you might feel are like weird questions, but questions <laughs> like, you know, what does this word mean? Or what is like, what is this specific part of this prayer say? Or um, what do you like, what's your favorite part of the service? What's your least favorite part of the service? Just to be engaged with whatever is going on. And, and like, it's okay if you don't know, I'm sure your partner understands. Um, I, uh, my partner is also Jewish and I love going to any sort of services that like, where I can sit and just be like, I, this was not my tradition. I wasn't raised in it, but I just look around and I think like, oh, look at all these people, like with all of these ways of interacting with God that, and with each other that I didn't know about. And like, it, that's so cool to me. So like really, I think engaging with your curiosity and showing your partner that you're interested um, can be great. Uh, you can also, uh, one of the things that I love doing for people is making them food. Um, so you can always think about like, is there going to be a meal involved? Could I bring a dish or is there going to be a meal before or after that like we, the two of us can have together? And like, is there something that they might particularly like to eat for that meal? I don't know. Food's a big thing for me. So that's something I always think about. Yeah, that's always a good, um, way to walk into a space if you don't maybe feel 100% comfortable is like having something to offer you walk in like... with brownies <laughs> yeah might want to have kosher brownies though check that out <laughs> <sighs> awesome well this was great Austin thank you so much for hanging out today and answering questions and sharing with us a little bit about your expertise and background um yeah and we hope that for those of you who are interested you'll come to the um, event next week you can check it out in our bio there's a link in there um yeah and we're going to continue to be doing a lot of stuff around faith and gender so keep on the lookout for stuff coming up awesome all right everybody we'll talk to you later bye bye